Recently, I was asked to preach a lesson about the similarities between Christianity and sports for a church's summer series program. And I'd like to share that lesson with you uh, tonight. Uh, I want to share it because it's, it's, it's quite a, revelant, uh, a relevant rather, topic today since athletes are in the news for not only their athletic abilities, but also for their political and social views, as well as their interest in business and the uh, entertainment industries. You know, if you look at the front page of a lot of newspapers, it's not just political uh, news and uh, you know, what's going on in business, but often there are stories about sports uh, on, the, on the front page. So for this reason, I've chosen to look at the athlete's experience in sport and how this is similar to a Christian's experience in his or her walk of faith. And I'd like to compare those two uh, this evening. In an article about sports, Kelly Mahoney of ThoughtsCo.com discusses various elements that make up the experience that every athlete has, no matter what sport they may play. I'd like to examine three of the most important of these and compare them with the experience that every Christian has in his faith walk with Christ, no matter who or when or where uh, they may exist. Elements of the sport experience. No matter what sport is played, all athletes experience the following. Preparation. Preparation, everyone who participates in sports from peewee teams to the major leagues has to prepare and practice. Learning the basic skills, practice and drills, repeating the plays, the moves, the routines over and over again, not to mention the time spent on physical condition training in the, in the gym, the mental training and preparation, perhaps studying the plays or studying the opposition, all these things are part of the preparation uh, for any athlete playing any sport. We know that athletes must prepare for weeks and continually practice for a contest that will only last perhaps only an hour or two. The most extreme uh, example of this um, is the preparation to contest ratio in uh, the uh, Olympic uh, sport of sprinting. Athletes who will prepare and train for four years in order to compete in the, for example, the 100 meter dash, that's about 109 yards, uh, which is over in 10 seconds. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can do that. You know, four years of prep for 10 seconds. Now the record holder, we see a picture of him here, Usain Bolt from Jamaica, 9.58 seconds, that's the record. 100 meter dash or run. He was clocked running at 28 miles an hour. It's awfully fast for a human being to run, 28 miles an hour. Now another sprinter, Tyson Gay of the United States, he came in second, 9.69 seconds, one tenth one-tenth of a second behind. Four years of preparation, one-tenth of a second behind for second place. Now the point I want to make uh, about preparation, whether it's amateur or pro sports, is that it requires self-control. You know, self-control is an essential part of training for sports. When in training you have to avoid the easy temptation to you know, eat poorly or not sleep well or slack off in practice or perhaps not give it 100% when you're in the gym. The key to effective preparation is the control one exercises over their mind and body to make these do what they naturally don't want to do. I don't want to do the last 25 of the 100 sit-ups. My body is saying enough already. Well, in the same way, Christians are continually in training for the spiritual walk or spiritual life that they have entered into when they become Christians. Now, the difference between Christians and athletes is that athletes prepare ahead of time for game day. But for Christians, every day is both game day and training day as the Holy Spirit trains us to live as Christians should 
in the changing and challenging circumstances of each passing day. Listen to what Peter says about this. Therefore, he says, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. He goes on, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so here Peter describes our training regimen and the goal that our spiritual exercises are designed to achieve. Self-control is the basis of our training, but not the objective of our training. It's the means, but it's not the end. The hope of heaven fully realized is the motivation, very much like the Olympic gold medal, for example, is the motivation for Olympic athletes. The actual exercise that produces the self-control um, is the moral and spiritual effort required to continually obey Christ and resist various and sinful, uh, various sinful and worldly practices every day. All day long, we have to make choices. You know, I have a, a rule of thumb. <laughs> if, I say it, if I say it out loud, I'll really have to do it every day, but I think it's a good thing. <laughs> I try saying no to myself at least once a day. Now, obviously, if I'm tempted to steal money, well, that, that doesn't count. You know, I mean, if I'm tempted to sin, but as a way of getting this flesh under control, I try to say no to myself at least once a day. Someone says something, I want to talk back, maybe this is the time I'm going to say no. Somebody offers that second piece of pie with ice cream, maybe that's the day. That'll be my one no to myself for that day. It's exercise. We fully understand the athlete's need to exercise in order to excel, but we sometimes forget that in spiritual life, we also have to exercise if we wish to excel. The goal is to be and live a holy life, a life that is increasingly separated from the world and increasingly devoted to God. So each day I bring my mind and my body into greater harmony with God's will in order to live a holy life which will ultimately transform me into a glorious eternal being when Jesus comes, there is an end to this contest that we're involved in from day to day. And so this process begins with the basic exercise of self-control without which neither the athlete nor the Christian can succeed. A second element in the sport experience or in the athlete's experience, perseverance. Perseverance, I want to quote Mahoney here. She writes, training to improve your abilities and performance requires perseverance as you train to the point of exhaustion in order for the body to build new muscle and improve its energy systems. Many athletes become discouraged at the slow rate of progress at times, or they become distracted by various trials like injuries or a change of coaches or, or, or teammates. Perseverance requires the willingness to stay the course despite the pain, despite the criticism, despite the obstacles, despite the doubt. I mean, uh, 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 the keys to cultivating perseverance are the, are the following. Number one, realize that there will be pain and suffering, for sure, uh, no doubt about it. This way you will not be surprised or angry or discouraged when it comes. You, know, you won't be saying, wait a minute, I thought you know, becoming a Christian, I would be joyful, everything would be fine, I would be happy, the Lord would protect me from you know, bad things. Yeah, where, where did you read that? <laughs> Certainly not in the Bible. Be prepared to suffer in some way. Realize that there will be pain and suffering in this life. Secondly, decide ahead of time that when these things happen, and they will, you will not quit. You will not throw in the towel. 
And thirdly, ask yourself if it will all be worth the effort. Don't wait until you're in the middle of the journey to ask and answer that question. Answer it up front before you even begin. And you know, not just you begin your life as a Christian, which is, you know, which is a good thing to do, but sometimes in our Christian life, I wouldn't say sometimes, many times in our a Christian life, we have like, we hit the restart button. You know, we're doing fine, we're doing fine, and then you know, we kind of, we get a little stale, or we wander off, or you know, we just get lazy, sloppy, whatever. Spiritually, we're not as, we're not as tight as we once were, and we begin to realize, you know, I'm, I'm skipping church, I'm not reading my Bible, I'm just, you know, I'm becoming involved in a lot more worldly activity, too much TV, not enough prayer time, you know. And, and you take yourself to task and you kind of set the reset button. Okay, I'm going you know, to tighten up here. Even at those moments when you press the reset button, understand that your recommitment will probably face some challenges. And so even when you recommit, you hit that button. Remember, when the challenges come, you've already decided that you're not, you're not going to quit. And then, Review often what God has promised those who finish, and that is, of course, eternal life in heaven with Him. Now these ideas are summarized for the Christian by the writer of Hebrews, where he says in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And Paul says, similarly, in Galatians 6, he says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. If he's saying, you know, if we do not grow weary, it must suggest that you know, Christian life is wearying at times. Many times we ask ourselves, I don't know if this is all worth it, or maybe this is too hard. And Paul is saying, when that time comes, Remind yourself why you're doing all of this and what's at the end here for us. The burden with athletes is that it's all on them. The training, the effort, the practice, it begins and it ends with them. Christians, on the other hand, have a resource to help them reach their goal, their prize. Christians must learn to transfer the burden for success from themselves to Jesus Christ. Our perseverance requires us to continually put our faith to finish the course and our hope for success on Jesus rather than ourselves. What does Paul say in Philippians? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I, I practice obedience and self-control to cultivate a Christian character pleasing to God and a good witness to non-believers. Yes, I do that. However, the experience that guarantees not only my salvation, but the ultimate prize of eternal life is my perseverance in the belief that these gifts are mine because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So you know, my, my success ratio goes up and down as far as doing what I want to do, obeying Christ, some days are good, some days are not so good, it goes up and down, but the constant that keeps me saved, that gives me hope, is that no matter how you know, the, the needle is up and down and how well I'm doing, I continue to believe throughout all of this that Jesus is the Son of God. And because of that, my salvation is secure. Elite athletes you know, uh, have great confidence in their physical strength and conditioning as well as their ability to win. Let's face it, most sports psychologists are there to convince them that they can do it. You can do it. Injuries you know, hold back an athlete, but sometimes the injury is in the mind. They, stop, they start thinking they really can't do it or they're not really good enough. And, you know, the, uh, the medicine for that is a, a dose of encouragement, reminding them that they are good and they are talented and they can win and our team is going to make it. Christians have the opposite challenge. They must avoid the attitude that they themselves can achieve salvation in heaven by what they do or how well they do it. Christians must always remember that they themselves cannot do it. 
They must depend completely on the sacrifice of Jesus and the mercy of God to achieve their prize, or their price, or their prize, excuse me. And herein lies the dual reality that every Christian must understand and deal with. Reality number one, what saves us is our belief that Jesus is the Son of God and our trust that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross makes restitution for all of our sins, thus sparing us from condemnation and spiritual death. That's reality number one. Reality number two, this belief is initially expressed in repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38, and then continually on display as this person perseveres in living a holy life each and every day. We are saved because we believe. We demonstrate that belief with holy living. We cultivate holy living through submission to God's word. Our faith saves us. The level of holiness we're at in our walk with Christ demonstrates our spiritual maturity. And then the third and common element, all sports, is the game itself. All the preparation and the sacrifice and the effort for athletes lead to the game, the match, the, the race, the contest. And each game has its own particular element that athletes must contend with. For example, within each game, there's competition. I mean, sports is all about competition and rivalry. Unfortunately, competition because of pride or the unchecked desire for recognition brings out the worst in some people, not the best. Competitiveness, the pressure to succeed or the fear of humiliation drive some athletes and some fans to cheat or to break the rules or to play dirty or to disrespect competitors. This type of hyper-competitiveness used to be the exception, but now it's become the norm as athletes and teams compete not only for the game itself, but now they compete for media recognition on television and especially on the internet. Anything goes now, Any, anything goes. Many athletes now use vulgarity and provocative trash talking and even offensive political statements to raise their profile on social media. It's not enough now for some, not all, I'm not making a blanket statement here, but it's not enough simply to be good on the field or to excel at your particular uh, game. No, no, now you have to get recognition. You have to get followers on Twitter or on Facebook. And for that, just being a, a, a top line athlete doesn't seem to be enough anymore. Now you have to say provocative things. Now you have to use vulgarity and so on and so forth. Again, not all athletes, but we see that more and more now. Thankfully, in the game that is a Christian living in the world without becoming of or like the world, in that game, believers don't compete with other Christians or unbelievers. Our fight, our contest is not with people, it's with spirits. This is our game. More clearly, Paul enumerates this in Ephesians 6, he says, finally, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes uh, of the devil. One more, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We don't battle each other. We battle lies. We battle false teaching. We fight against the plans and movements engineered and directed by Satan. We defend against moral and physical attacks upon ourselves by the evil one and his demons. That's our fight. I mean, Satan wins when we're fighting each other. Boy, when, the, <laughs> when you get to a church and in the church, we're fighting each other. Well, Satan has the complete victory then because he's the enemy. He's the one we're fighting against. And our weapons, they're not physical, they're spiritual in nature. We continue to read the same passage. He says, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, 
In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Our game plan is to stand firm, meaning we continue to believe and conduct ourselves as Christians despite the attacks. Our weapons are number one, God's word used to expose the lies and shine the light of truth in this dark world. Secondly, our own faith expressed in holy living as our witness for Christ. And thirdly, the proclamation of the gospel to all nations as our counterattack. How do we counterattack? Well, we preach the gospel, that's how we counterattack. <laughs> athletes and Christians are similar in that they each compete, but athletes compete with other men or women, and after the game is over, they shake hands and everyone goes home normally. Christians, for, uh, uh, Christians uh, on the other hand, compete against spirits and the evil one, and the game is unto death. Our, our game, our life, our competition, it's a fight to the death. In sports you get hurt, there are injuries, but those are not the purpose of the sport. I think that some Christians would be more successful in the Christian walk or game if they realized who the true opposition was. Not other Christians or unbelievers, but Satan and evil spirits and what, what, what the game is all about. I mean, Satan's constant attempt to destroy the faith and the soul of Christians. That's the game. That's a serious game. Some people say, well, well those, Mike's preaching some serious sermon. Well, this is a serious thing. That this evil, powerful spirit has one goal when it comes to me or you, and that's to destroy me, to destroy my soul, to ruin what I hope for. That's the game that we're playing here. It's a very serious game. Another element, you know, when I say each game has an element, you know, one of them is competition that I spoke of. Another element of the game, winning and losing. Whether it is athletes competing in sport or the Christian living out his faith, each has to deal with the elements of winning and losing. We judge the talent and skill of the athlete by his or her performance in the game, but we measure his character in the way he handles winning or losing. We value more highly those athletes who are gracious in victory and honest in defeat. You know, when the winner shows respect for the loser and receives the cheers of the crowd with an attitude of humility and gratitude, that person shows not only that he is a superior athlete, but also a great human being worthy of the honor that he is receiving. You know, a good example of this, good example of a successful athlete not popular with the people is the boxer Floyd Mayweather Jr. He is the only boxer in history to have a 50 win and zero lost record. Think about that, 50 wins. And he's fought some of the very best boxers you know, in, his, in his field, 50 wins. He's never lost, not once. And he's also fabulously wealthy because of you know, his success in boxing. However, Whenever he showed up, whenever they said, here's the challenger, so and so, and now the world, the reigning world champion, and he'd come out, boo, people would boo him. <laughs> he was booed by the crowd when he fought, and he was an unpopular champion because of his bragging and his habit of flaunting his wealth. He'd throw around $100 bills, you know, just to show that ah, money, nothing to it. I got plenty. And so he was, well still is, a gifted athlete, but he wasn't a nice person. And for that reason, he never had the respect of the boxing fans. I mean, what do you got to do? 50-0 record, you still get no respect, why? Because you're just not a gracious person. Because you neither know how to win, well, you've never lost, but <laughs> you haven't even learned how to win. 50 wins and you still don't know how to win. And so, if, if, if winning is a way of judging an athlete's skills, losing is then a way of determining an athlete's limits. Now, you know, I mentioned 
Usain Bolt's winning 100 meter sprint in 9.58 seconds with Tyson Gay has never been able to break. He's raced in other races, uh, Tyson Gay, never been able to break that. Never done better than 9.69. And yet Tyson Gay was gracious and honest about Usain Bolt's superior time and talent. I mean, it's only a tenth of a second, right? But it's a tenth of a second faster than him. It, that tenth of a second means that Usain Bolt's name is known throughout the world. He goes everywhere in the world. Everybody knows who he is. And he gets offers for you know, endorsements for products and he's lauded and championed and he's written about and they got books about him. Tyson Gay, a tenth of a second behind, sorry. No worldwide recognition for you. Uh, he's well known in the track and field world. You know, and he's a respected athlete, but nothing. Nothing like Usain Bolt. Tenth of a second, a lifetime of training. And yet, for this reason, because he's such a gracious loser, he has the respect and the admiration of, admiration of his fans for his own accomplishments. I mean, only a tenth of a second behind. Now, as far as the Bible is concerned, the use of athletic imagery is not used with the game element of winning and losing. I'd like to finish this lesson by examining some of these passages to see what these sports references teach us as Christians, because there are a lot of allusions to sports in the Bible. Let's start with 1 Corinthians. Paul says, do you not know that those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Uh, they then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So Paul uses the running and boxing sports that were part of the Olympic and Isthmus games of that era. He notes that athletes train hard for games that will reward them with temporary awards. You know, the wreath, the money, the fame. He says that in the same way, Christians must train themselves for their contest, which is faithful Christian living to the end. And he says cultivating self-control is part of that. Paul makes the point that in athletic competition, there are both winners and losers. In the same way, in the Christian race, those who do not train will lose. And he uses himself as an example. Imagine, even an apostle who falls away can lose the prize of eternal life, which is the reward of a faithful life. Anyone who says, oh, it's impossible to lose your salvation, hasn't carefully read 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul is referring to himself being in danger of losing the prize if falls away. Another reference to sports in Galatians says, you were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Here Paul simply compares the Christian's life to a foot race that can be interrupted by various obstacles. You know, uh, uh, just as, <coughs> excuse me, just as in normal foot races, you know, cramps, foot blisters, the weather, all kinds of obstacles. In this case it was false teachers coming into the church, trying to lure them into a false notion that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. That was the obstacle they were running into in their race. And so just as in the athletic endeavors, the Christian life has to deal with distractions, obstacles, challenges that takes the focus away from our goal, which is being faithful to Christ unto death. Somebody says, well, what's Christian life all about? The answer, being faithful to Christ until death. That's what it's all about. You can take everything that I'm doing in everyday life and, I, and boil it all down. What am I, what's the goal? I want to be faithful to Jesus until the end. That's all, that's what I'm shooting for. Everything I do has this as a purpose. When I have to make an important decision about something, of course, Lisa and I, we discuss it, obviously, if it involves our family and our relationships, so on and so forth. But one of the factors is always, how will this affect my faith? 
Will this put a challenge before me? Am I putting an obstacle in my own way? Too many times we make decisions, you know, life decisions based only on how much money or what advantage it will give me, or oh, this will kickstart my business or my career, and never for a moment ask themselves, what about my faith? Will this thing here, if I go east, will it hurt my faith in some way? Will it be better if I go west? Will that, be, will that advantage my faith? Never mind my career, what about my faith? Another allusion to sports and games, 2 Timothy says also if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So the athlete must train to have the strength and skill to play the game. And he also has to know the game, the rules, the strategy, what works, what doesn't work. You know, professional golfers, they, they can have the lowest score and you know, win some, some prizes are two or three million dollars, but they can lose the game and lose and forfeit all that money if they don't fill out their scorecard properly. <laughs> you don't have to have a little adding mistake. You can't go to the judges on a professional golf tournament and say, oh, give me back the card here, let me just erase that. There's a reason that there are no erasers on pencils they give you when you play golf, except Ron, he has one, but that's, we're not, <laughs> we're not gonna, that's ugly, we're not going to bring that up. In the same way, Christians need to follow Christ according to the Lord's teachings and not according to their own ideas. What does Jesus say in Matthew 28, 20? Teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. It's one of my pet peeves, you know, I tell people who are teaching in all the classes from you know, cradle row all the way up to the adult class, we're not just teaching the information about the Bible, we ought to be teaching how do people obey the teachings that are in the Bible? How do we conform to these? How do we apply these in our lives? Very, very uh, important. And so in this passage, Paul tells Timothy to pass on to others what he himself has received from Paul, because these are the teachings that lead to salvation. I often hear very motivated and sincere believers say things like, well, you know, I've got my own relationship with God or Jesus. I don't, I don't need the church. Or, you know, God loves those who love. No need for doctrine. Or, you know, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in organized religion. <laughs> and I want to say, really? <laughs> God believes in organized religion? Have you read the Old Testament? How organized that religion was? So the one thing that these people have in common is their ignorance of God's actual will and word contained in the Bible. Believers have to know God's word and develop their ability to obey it if they want to successfully live the Christian life and receive the prize of eternal life. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also <clears throat> excuse me, he made the world. We listen to Christ now, not the little voice in our head. We listen to Christ. He is the one that tells us how to play the game and how to win the game. And so today God speaks to mankind only through Jesus Christ and no one else. And so in the end, the takeaway in this lesson on Christians as spiritual athletes can be stated in the following way. Only those who finish receive the prize. Only those who finish receive the prize. For athletes, only the best, only the ones that win get the crown or the cup or the prize. However, God has made different rules for Christians in that everyone who runs and finishes the race receives a reward. So it's not how fast you run, it's if you finish or not that determines the prize. This is encouraging for slow runners like me and it is motivating because all can be winners and not just one person. All of us can win. That's the rule of the game. All who finish faithfully receive the prize. 
So my prayer therefore is that in the Christian race, you, all of you, my brothers and sisters, will run as best you can and most importantly, you will finish the race. And so my invitation is fairly straightforward tonight after this lesson. If you need help in starting the race by becoming a Christian, and you do that by acknowledging your faith in Christ, repenting of your sins, and being immersed in the waters of baptism. If you haven't done this, then you're watching the race and you're hearing about the race from the pew, but you're not actually in the race. And like all spectators, you will not share in the prize. I love that when the guys in the, you know, uh, the championship, the Stanley Cup, you know, hockey championship, and the guys go, yeah, my team won, we won, we won, except you don't get a check. <laughs> it's only the guys on the ice that get a check. The goalie, and the, you know, the center, the right wing, left wing, and the, uh, the trainers, the coaches, the assistant coach, they get a check, they get a ring. But the guys sitting in the audience you know, who applaud and are happy, they don't, they don't get a ring, they don't get a check. So don't think if you're just sitting there observing Christianity, that this is a way that you will receive the prize at the end. No, 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 no. You have to be on the field. You have to be in the game if you want to win the prize. Only those who run and finish get a crown, not those who just watch. And of course, if you need help to continue the race because you're tired or you've broken some of the rules of the game, then let the church encourage and pray for you as we think about these things and as we stand and sing the, uh, the song of encouragement that Titus has prepared for us.